وقفت بوجه ظلام يتيما عاريا حافيا Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this significant teaching, detailing the historical analysis and present day connections of what's happening in Palestine. My name is Ayana Clemens. I use she, her pronouns based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And as one of the SMA regional organizers, I am privileged to support the moderation for tonight's educational experience. This offering this evening has been organized by leaders of the National Council of Elders to support the consciousness building and understanding of what is happening in Palestine in order to address, publicize, and resist the attacks on Palestinians as organizers and participants of the social movements in the South. Thank you again as kin of the Southern Movement Assembly which is a formation of organizations and assemblies that converge Southern front lines to collectively develop shared action plans that are rooted in political alignment. We acknowledge that the role of leadership in this moment is to practice bottom-up grassroots governance to build movement infrastructure. The connecting points of resistance with the people of Palestine that we are going to explore this evening is merely a glimpse into the unraveling realities of the crumbling infrastructures that we are undergoing. We invite you all to utilize this teach-in as a tool for education, to inspire mobilization, and the building of movements that can support the Palestinian resistance and those of all oppressed peoples in the US and Global South. Before we begin, just a few things about our flow for tonight. If you have any questions or highlights throughout this discussion, we encourage you to please place them in the chat. We definitely don't wanna forget them. We ask you to please remain on mute in order to prevent disruptions. Please note that these calls will be recorded and shared, as, shout, shared out as a resource to you all, excuse me. Following this discussion from our professors, we will invite you all to come off a of mute and engage in a question and answer section. And then please note that this is a safe space, a space free of judgment. Know that no question is a small or basic question. We want all of us to use this experience as an opportunity to deepen our analysis together. At this time, I'm gonna encourage you all to please drop some introductions in the chat. Let folks know where you're joining from, what organization or assembly that you're representing and how you're doing today. And so before I introduce our speakers, I'm gonna invite National Council of Elders member and organizer, Suzanne Farr, to ground us by reading a letter that was written by the members of the National Council of Elders calling for peace and justice in Israel, Palestine. Thank you, Suzanne. The National Council of Elders call for peace and justice in Israel and Palestine. As the National Council of Elders, we aspire to a culture of peace, having learned through many years of struggle to resist the culture of violence, which pervades and propels society in the US. We're coming to understand our work as building a culture of peace rooted in justice. We speak from our hearts and calling for an end to the violence in Israel and Palestine. The essential violence of colonization is to dis disrupt the relationship between human beings and the land. We see this in the current crisis and throughout the world. Now, with a fierce new urgency, we call upon people of conscience to come forward to demand an immediate ceasefire by the Israeli government, Hamas, and all parties in Gaza, and for the immediate delivery of humanitarian aid. 
we call for the end of Israeli occupation, the restoration of Palestinian lands and authority, excuse me, excuse me, autonomy, and for an end to the U.S. military support for the state of Israel. Palestinians have peacefully resisted occupation and oppression through mass mobilization, public education, public art, and direct resistance. Within Israel, there is a growing movement for justice. Individuals, artists, military personnel, and faith-based organizations are risking state oppression as they stand with Palestinians and work to end the oppressive practices and policies of the Israeli state. Many Jewish Americans have been courageous in supporting justice for Palestinians. Their actions are opening new ways to make clear that criticism of the Israeli state is not rooted in anti-Semitism, but in a profound understanding of how settler colonialism distorts the best of our cultures and human aspirations. We urge you to join with those in your community who are defend, demanding a ceasefire now. And we also call upon your, ask you to call upon your representatives to refuse to provide military aid to Israel. As activists over the last 60 years, we have been cultivators of the seeds of peace and beloved community. Our vision continues. Thank you much, so much, Suzanne, for grounding us. Now I have the honor and privilege of introducing our speakers and our educators for this evening. Y'all, this is a powerhouse team with folks who have had much experience and contributions to our movements. So we want to thank them for their offerings of their support to our learnings. So tonight, we will hear from Barbara Smith, who is an author, an activist, and an independent scholar who has played a groundbreaking role in the opening up of a national, cultural, and political dialogue about the intersections of race, class, sexuality, and gender. She was one of the one among the first to define an African American woman's literary tradition and to build Black women's studies and Black feminism in the United States. She has been politically active in many movements for social justice since the 1960s. She was a co-founder of the Combi River Collective and of Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. And Barbara, I hope you correct me if I'm wrong on that pronunciation. Barbara served two terms as a member of the Albany Common Council from 2006 to 2013. And in 2005, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Barbara is also an active member of the Albany Justice Coalition, the Ukraine Solidarity Network, Black for Palestine, and Jewish Voice for Peace. She is a senior advisor to Women's March, a member of the coordinating team for the National Council of Elders. Thank you for joining us, Barbara. Next, we're gonna have um, Gwendolyn Zahora Simmons, who is a retired professor in Mersha in African American and Religious Studies and affiliated faculty in Women's Studies at the University of Florida. She obtained her BA from Antioch University in Human Service and her MA in Religious Studies in Islamic Studies for Temple University in Philadelphia. Zahora became active in the Civil Rights Movement during her freshman year at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia in 1962. There she joined with scores of students and others to desegregate restaurants, theaters, and other public places. She became a SNCC Student Nonviolent Violent Coordinating Committee Field Secretary two years later in the summer of 1964, when she joined hundreds of other college age volunteers who traveled to Mississippi to work in the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. She was assigned to Laurel, Mississippi, where she became one of three women project directors 
in the state working there for a total of 18 months. And then last but not least, we're going to have Chattanooga comrade and educator, former professor of political science, Fahad McGrawby. And Fahad, as I invite you to begin to, to kick us off with our discussion, I'm going to ask that you just give a short bio about yourself. I know we were having issues getting that, but just want to make space for you just to give a short bio about yourself before we jump into our first question. I was uh, born in uh, in a small village near west of Jerusalem called Ain Karim. It's the village of St. John the Baptist. And uh, in 1948, we were kick kicked out of our home and, and ended up as refugees in Bethlehem. And uh, so I grew up in Bethlehem, in a French Catholic school. And then uh, I finished there, and then I came to the U.S. to go to college. And uh, I graduated from Duke University with a B.A. and an M.A. in international law. And then I went back to the Middle East. And then uh, uh, after that, I went to France. I lived for a number of years, and I got my Ph.D. there. And then uh, I came back to the U.S. to, to teach. Uh, I was, I've been politically active for all my life and uh, at a variety of levels. I worked uh, with the UN at, on various occasions. I was a, an advisor to the PLO, the Yasser Arafat in particular, with whom I had a very good uh, relationship. I carried messages to him from Jimmy Carter, for example. Um, I worked with a team convened by Professor Kelman at Harvard on coexistence with Jewish colleagues, Israeli, uh, Palestinian colleagues, and some American mediator types. And um, so all my life has been touched by this conflict and the search for justice. And for dignity, I condemn anti-Semitism in all of its versions. I uh, I'm proud to be an American, but this is, as I look around, I am not sure this is the America I have known and loved. Uh, it looks, to, feels to me, right at the moment, uh, except for you. Uh, that I'm living in enemy territory. And I hope this doesn't last. Uh, and that uh, with our efforts like this and other people's efforts, we can correct this and uh, steer the ship a little bit better. Um, so that's it. Absolutely. Thank you so much and, and happy to be sharing space with you. Um, but I do want to kick us our conversation off, you know, with, with a basic question for someone that might be just now, you know, either coming into movement or, you know, they're turning the TV screen on and they see what's happening in Palestine, um, but they may not fully understand. Could you give a little bit about the historical context of, of what's happening right now? When did it originate and and really break it down for us? Actually, you know, the Zionist movement is the movement that finally established the state of Israel. And the Zionist movement began in Europe in the latter part of the 19th century. The 19th century was the century of nationalism and settler processes uh, and migrations. So, um, the Jews, uh, some European Jews, led by people like Theodore Herzl, were trying to come up with options for to save Jews from the pogroms and the discrimination and the uh, bad dis treatment they were suffering in, in Europe, in various parts of Europe. And uh, so there, there was the beginning of a small dribble of colonization that began literally in 1882 to Palestine. 
and uh, it went on uh, until after the war, the First World War. And then uh, with the Balfour Declaration that was issued by the British Mandate, in, on, on the, which assumed control of Palestine after the war, uh, the, the, the Balfour Declaration was actually a promise to the Jews to help them build a national home uh, in Palestine with the caveat that this should not uh, impinge on the rights of the local inhabitants. Um, and the British mandate began to facilitate more rapid migration to Palestine. And then uh, with the coming of Nazism and the problems of Europe, um, and the Holocaust, the migration, the rate of migration began to accelerate. And uh, ironically, many of the ships carrying re Jewish refugees escaping the Holocaust were turned away from the U.S. and, and forced to go to, uh, to Palestine. And, uh, but by 1947, when the U.N. decided to partition Palestine into two states, uh, in, an Arab state and a Jewish state, um, and a special provision for uh, internationalization of the Jerusalem area, um, that uh, uh, partition resolution was rejected by the Arabs and, of course, welcomed by the, by the Jews. And, um, and there, it was rejected by the Arabs because it gave the Jewish uh, inhabitants who were uh, something like 600,000 out of a population of a million and a half, 54% um, of the land area, mostly the fertile coastal area. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, this was followed by 1948. And in 1948, the Jews, after fighting through many uh, uh, um, military organizations like the Haganah and Ergun and so on, they tried to establish their own state in Palestine. They uh, did it uh, as a settler colonial project, literally. So you know, nationalism in Europe, along with settler colonialism, were the primary motivators for the Jews. And of course, the escape, the need to escape the persecution from Europe. And uh, so 1948 resulted in uh, about four or 500 villages being evacuated and about 700,000 Palestinians became refugees. And that was known as the first Nakba. Nakba means disaster for, in Arabic. And uh, anyhow, it, uh, it's, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a project that has been characterized by ethnic cleansing. And sometimes the ethnic cleansing would get severe and vicious, and sometimes it becomes indirect and slow and methodical and, and subtle. Lately, lately, Israel has developed uh, with Bibi Netanyahu and probably the most extreme government in Israel's history um, with the unleashing of settlers who are Messianic Jews who believe that they're doing God's work on, in, in the land. And uh, the, the, the level of, of torment and the level of uh, settler violence has increased substantially. So not only do we see what we see in Gaza, which is where the inhumanity is, is, is just mind-boggling, uh, but we also see an acceleration of, of attacks against the Palestinians in, in the West Bank. And so, you know, it, you know, it, you know it, it's not just, it's easy to say that what they're doing in Gaza is to try to fight Hamas, 
But what they're doing in the West Bank has nothing to do with it. It's just part of the whole process of trying to grab more land and to force as many Palestinians out of their home as they can. So that's where we are. Thank you so much. And and if anyone um, that's that's watching and listening in, if you have any questions pertaining to the history that McGravy just shared, feel free to hold on to those or put those in the chat so that we can dig deeper as the conversation goes on. But thank you so much. I want to just jump it over to you, Zahara. You know, as we're hearing about the history um, that's happened in Palestine, I'm hearing about settler colonialism, and I'm like, this is not the first time we're hearing about this. Can you uh, explain a little bit about the connections that's happening um, in the history of what's happened to Palestinian people to the history of oppression that's happened here in the, the U.S.? And you're on mute, let me see. Okay. There you are. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for that. No worries. Well, good evening to everyone on the call, and thank you to uh, the uh, organizers of this event at such a critical time uh, in what is happening and has been happening uh, in Palestine. Um, one way for people who may not be so familiar with what do we mean by settler colonialism and you know um you know i'm an elder which means i'm an old older person and i grew up in the jim crow era in memphis tennessee and you know one of the things that <clears throat> uh we did on the weekend my friends and i we went to the movies uh, on Saturday for the Saturday matinee. I think it might've cost 25 cents, you know, and all the movies were cowboy and Indian movies. And here we were in the belly of apartheid, uh, not knowing any of the real history of this country. We were jumping up and down, rooting for the cowboys when they killed the Indians. And, you know, later on, I realized how outrageous and wrong that was. But, hey, you know, I had no idea uh, at that time and not till much later, you know, that the people who settled uh, the United States had killed the indigenous people here. And so the United States is a settler colony. Uh, that came in and uh, from all kinds, you know, from many places in Europe and drove the native people uh, out of their land and onto reservations. And this is very similar uh, to what has happened in Palestine. And of course, this is not something we're taught because we're always uh, focused on, and rightly so in, in the case of the Holocaust and the suffering of the uh, Jewish people uh, in Europe. Uh, but we, so, you know, in many cases, we heard that old adage that the Jews were a people uh, looking for land and Palestine was a land without people. And that turned out to be a, a big lie. I really learned uh, began learning about this whole issue when I was uh, a, a person working for SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And SNCC was the first civil rights organization to uh, put out a statement uh, against the occupation of Palestine. And this was in August of 1967. And we were learning about uh, you know, the international issues and learning about the place of Black people in the world's, uh, in the, uh, what shall I say, the, the struggle around the world for justice and how we here in the United States as Black people who had been brought here in chains and kept enslaved uh, for so many decades uh, and of course, all of the struggles we were going through 
to end uh, the Jim Crow system that had been set up after Reconstruction. So in SNCC, we were reading, we were discussing, and this is when I first really learned about uh, what had happened uh, that Brother Fuad was telling you he is one of the persons who was kicked out of his homeland during the Nakba in 1948. And many of you are now aware, unlike how I was uh, taught about our Native American uh, brothers and sisters and what has happened to them. So that's some background. Now, let me rush ahead uh, to say that when I began working for the American Friends Service Committee, a Quaker organization, uh, I really began learning about the Palestinian issue. The Quakers, particularly the AFSC, uh, had been involved in this issue for many, many years. And while I uh, was working for them, I went on my first peace delegation uh, to the Middle East. And we traveled to Israel, to Palestine, to Jordan, to Egypt, to Syria. And uh, when I first arrived, uh, you know, first of all, there was so much racism directed at me in Tel Aviv at the airport uh, that I was just shocked and stunned. Uh, and maybe during the Q and A, we can uh, you might want to know exactly what happened to me. And uh, and this was 1994. But once. Uh, I got out of interrogation for hours about why was I there and what did I want and why did I have Zohara as a name. Uh, by the time I got out and joined my delegation and I was the only black person in the delegation and we began our travels, I was like, oh, I know what's going on here. Cause you know, <laughs> but is only worse than what I grew up in, in the Jim Crow era. So seeing the checkpoints and the uh, just harsh treatment uh, of the Palestinian people, it was heartbreaking. And uh, so uh, I also, you know, have been working very much uh, for ending the occupation from my SNCC days going forward. And lastly, I went back in another delegation, an international Quaker delegation with Quakers from uh, many places in the world. And that was in 2002. And it was much worse than it was in 1994. Mm -hmm. By that time, uh, the apartheid wall uh, had been constructed, people's more land grabs and the settlements, oh my God, that had been built on Palestinian land, uh, it was, uh, and going into the villages and hearing the stories of the suffering of the people. One of the worst uh, places, of course, was Gaza. I did get to Gaza on both delegations. And I mean, I you know, I'd never seen anything like that. And I just couldn't even believe that the Israelis would treat people like this, given their own history. It was heartbreaking. I cried every night that I was there. And I was very ashamed to be a quote unquote American. I didn't want anybody to know that I had anything to do with America because I knew that it was our tax dollars and our government that was propping up uh, apartheid. Uh, in Palestine and Israel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sahara, um, for connecting the dots on that history. Barbara, I want to ask you, you know, we're hearing the connecting parallels. We're seeing where the differences are being exacerbated. Sahara just named out two, two to three benchmarks and, and said that it's getting worse. What are social movements up against at this moment of, you know, rising fascism and rising white supremacy? What are we up against? What what's what do we need to be preparing for as social movements? Uh, thank you so much, and thank you to uh, my co-panelists uh, as well. As we said before, uh, the 
participants in the audience came in, I said, all of us are here learning this evening. It's not just those of us who are on the panel. I will actually want to talk about um, something else. Instead of talking in general about what social movements are facing now, I want to talk about where we are as movements during this particular his historical moment. We have some things to feel okay about. The fact that there has been robust and constant, consistent protest around the slaughter of civilians in Gaza, and also in the West Bank, although the focus is Gaza, there's also been a lot of killings in the West Bank as well, generally carried out by uh, by settlers, Israeli settlers, not necessarily by the army. But the thing is that we have been keeping up the fight, and that is a global movement. When we do something to protest the uh, the genocide and the ethnic cleansing that is happening right now, as we sit here and speak with each other, whenever we do something, we are a part of a global movement and we're standing up on the right side of history. Uh, what makes it complicated? Some people wonder, there are like lots of wars going on in lots of different places. In Sudan, you know, in Syria, in the Congo, why is it that we're so focused on this particular set of people in conflicts? And no one's asked me this before, but I think I'll try to answer it. <laughs> and that is that uh, because of the uh, population of the United States and who the population of the United States identifies with, and the fact that the United States is a white supremacist country, we are, of course, more drawn to and interested in, in general, not, I'm not saying us tonight here, but in general, this country is more concerned about what happens to people of European heritage than they are of people of other heritages. So uh, we've seen that throughout our uh, history. And because there is a real family connection, an actual connection between Israeli Jews and Jews in the United States, families, you know, who have some members here and some people in Israel, people are uh, going to visit uh, and spending time there. The birthright you know, initiative to get young Jewish people to accept from the United States to accept Zionism and to be very hostile to the human rights and the and the rights of uh, Pal uh, Palestinians. All of that is true. So it's not like the United States is a blank slate. The tensions, the problems, the issues that we have, and I would name them as racism and anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, uh, white supremacy, and also racial capitalism and imperialism, all of that stuff is a really toxic mix of how we understand who our neighbors are and who we stand up for. One of the things that I do, and I've been doing a lot of work since October 17th, that, that is a lot more work <laughs> uh, than, than usual uh, because of what, has or what is happening there. But one of the things I try to do is I speak up about the fact that there is such a thing as anti-Semitism, that anti-Zionism is not equal to and is not the same thing as anti-Semitism. There's such a thing as Islamophobia, and there's such a thing as racism. All these things mixing together. So we have to have a kind of clarity about what's happening so that we can understand uh, where we want to be in relationship to other humans at this time. I want to be with humans in a way to stop the suffering. That's always been an objective of mine. And I think it's probably your objective as well. Black people uh, in the United States and elsewhere have a really um, long relationship with Palestinians and solidarity. Uh, around the Palestinian struggle, I think because we see ourselves there. We identify. They see us, we see them. There were Palestinians who were Palestinian Americans, probably, um, who are already here. But when Ferguson happened, they were out there in the streets with us. And um, people like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali 
other people have been in solidarity over the decades, uh, over the decades. So we have that kind of solidarity, and this is a time for that. At the very same time, we can also say that slaughtering uh, Israelis who are non-combatants, men, women, and children, that's not right either. So we can stand up, you know, for humanity at the very same time that we look at what's going on. But we cannot equate the status of Israel with Palestine. We cannot do that because it's Israel that is has colonized and has kicked people off their homeland. So even though uh, death and, 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 and violence happened in both places, we are not saying that it's all, all things are equal. As a feminist, I would just like to say something about uh, different people's solutions for conflict. Um, I see patriarchal man manifestations of like, how, how, do we, how do we solve this? Oh, well, I'm gonna kill you. No, I'm gonna kill you first, you know? Oh, I'm gonna hurt you. Oh, I think I can beat you, you know? And I mean, I'm not being a, uh, I'm not saying that all women are peaceful by no means. We have some great examples of people who have led countries who are far from it. But the thing is that uh, there are feminist perspectives about this as well. There are black perspectives about this. There is global solidarity and we have to uh, stand up. That's all I would say. So both both challenges and also leaps forward with uh, our consciousness. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Mugabe, I'm gonna pass it over to you to close out this portion of our discussion. And I appreciate you, Barbara, for kicking it off, you know, and naming what we could be doing right now and how even this teaching um, is an act of solidarity. But I also wanna want to ask you, Mugabe, what could we be doing um, in addition to that? When we all leave this teaching, um, what is something that we could do um, as a call to action to show more solidarity? Yeah, I have a, I, 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 I jotted down a few notes about this, but before I go on, I, I just really want to say how deeply honored I am to be with these two panelists. And uh, to me, uh, it's, uh, I feel, I feel, I feel what they feel and uh, it's wonderful. And I thank you. Uh, I think, this government, I, you know, there is, I just, sorry, I just, uh, before before I, we came on, I uh, got a message from a colleague of mine, he's, he's a professor at uh, University of Maryland uh, who does public opinion surveys. And uh, his name is Shibli Talhani, he's mm -hmm. Palestinian. Uh, and he, he's an excellent pollster. The latest poll he did, at the University of Maryland shows that whatever sympathy Israel got as a result of what happened in uh, October 7, they lost with what they did in Gaza and what they're doing in Gaza. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to me to see the, the incredible explosion of support, even in the United States. And it's clear to me that public opinion in the United States will not accept this. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a gap between public opinion, American public opinion, especially educated public opinion, enlightened public opinion, and the American government. Not only the American government, but I think the entire political class in this country is totally removed from the, from, from the population it is alleged to represent. Uh, so I think we need to try to educate, we need to mobilize, uh, we need to call for an immediate ceasefire. And I think it's no longer enough just to have prayers and slogans. It's important to find ways to act, things to do. Um, already, you know, you have countries all over the world calling for breaking off diplomatic relations with Israel. I mean, Belgium this morning, Spain, Bolivia, Chile, and on and on and on. And I think there'll be more to come. Um, so we need to, we need to hold Israel 
and the U.S. government accountable, both of them, uh, because they have given Israel the green light. I mean, what does it mean when you say it's not the right time to have a ceasefire? It means, okay, you go on and do more killing. How much more killing can you do? You, do, you, do you need? And uh, in any case, so um, the there is a there is a movement, a boycott and divestment movement. B, the BDS movement has been very successful and has made some some inroads, and I think we need to support that. And I think we need to get educated about all the products that uh, invest in the settlements, for example, like uh, Starbucks and, and, and so on and so forth. And I think we need to call for the boycott. Uh, we need to put economic pressure on Israel and uh, in order to, to, to have them feel the pain and have them. This is the, the worst the worst and the most racist, extremist government in its history. And I think, you know, Biden should, but I don't think he has the guts. He should save Israel from itself, basically. But he uh, is unable to do that. And I think, but they need to be hearing from us. The administration and the State Department need to have a constant flow of protests, constant flow of protests. They should feel the heat. And uh, so uh, I can talk more, but but I think I think you know everybody should say, well, what is a little thing I can do? Write a letter. That's the least I could do. Write a letter and do it once a week, not just you know, one shot deal. Uh, find Get educated about the boycott pro uh, process. Get educated about the conflict and its history and so on. Um, I can, anybody who's interested, I can send them, I can email them all kinds of material that they can read um, by both Palestinian scholars, Israeli scholars, American scholars. Uh, and I think it's important for people to realize that not all Jews support this. Not all Jews support this. A lot of Jews are very, very unhappy with this. And a lot of Israelis are unhappy about this as well. So um, if you're criti critical, that doesn't mean you're anti-Semitic, as Barbara said. Uh, and it doesn't. Uh, and I think I think it's, uh, it's the least we could do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Zahar, I want to pass it to you. Um, seems like you have a, a response to what McGravy has just offered. Yes. Yes. Am, am I uh, unmuted? I am. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. I just wanted to, um, sh you know, remind all of us that as Barbara said, and as Fuad said, you know, a genocide is happening right now. I mean, I was on uh, Al Jazeera right before getting on. The number is 10,700 uh, identified dead. That doesn't even count uh, the thousands that are under the rubble that have not been pulled out. And we don't even know, you know who's alive still in certain places given that they're bombing every day, all day. Uh, so, um, and we know that there are for over 4,000 children uh, who have been killed. And that too is not counting how many of them may be under the rubble. I mean, we're talking about a, a catastrophe. Uh, and so what we all, I think, absolutely have to do is to be in touch with the White House and to say, not in my name. Uh, that we want a ceasefire now. This is critical because they're killing people every day. And um, I saw something uh, today that was just shocking. I mean, there were lines of people, they were all carrying white flags and they were marching by foot 
from the south to the north as they are being ordered to do, but it was on foot and it was hundreds of them and they were all carrying white flags, you know, in the hope that Israel wouldn't bomb them as they're trying to flee, as they've been told to do from the north, so uh, to the south. So we have to also be in touch with our uh, representatives, and we have to really, as Fua was saying, we have to, I'm calling every day, I know they're so sick of me, they don't know what to do, to say, cease fire now and let the humanitarian aid in. You know, talking about 50 trucks, it was 500 trucks a day going in before what's happening now. And they're sometimes letting 20 trucks in. And then I also saw that there was a truck from Egypt full of bottled water today and Israel bombed that truck and all the water was smattered and lying all over the ground. And there were people picking through, trying to find bottles that were still intact to drink. I mean, this is the most inhumane thing I have ever witnessed. And I've been to Vietnam, to Cambodia. I mean, you know, I've seen some bad stuff. But this, this is the worst. And it's on our watch. And it's being paid for by our tax dollars. So we must tell our government, no more. Stop it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sahara. And I think that is a, a good transition. We definitely want to give folks an opportunity to raise any questions to our speakers and our educators for the evening. Um, we're going to transition to gallery view so that we can see everyone. But I just want to invite anyone who has a question. I see we have Rita on stack. Um, if you dropped a question in the chat, please, please, please uh, hold that and come off mute. We encourage you to engage with our panelists. Uh, but Rita, I'm going to pass it to you for your question. Thank you. You are still muted, Rita. Well, first, I, I wanted to thank the presenters. Thank you so much for the uh, the complexity and the fullness of your presentation and making the connections. I really appreciate that. Ayana, it's less of a question and I hope you don't mind, but I was thinking too, that the other thing, in addition to what everybody has said, is we should be demanding our, that our institutions take positions on this. Institutions like trade unions, institutions like churches, uh, institutions like PTAs, uh, whatever you know, community work you're involved in uh, associations, sociologists, you know, whatever kind of uh, organization that you're involved in, start raising this question of how can you be silent uh, at this? Because um, I think that this complicity with the Biden administration, with the fact that this is being done in our name, if we can get some of these uh, so-called democratic institutions to take a position and send that forward. I think it would, um, I think, it, I think it's something that we ought to be doing as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rita. And yes, just contributing to our next steps and, and ways that we can all show up in this moment and for the future. Let's see, I just wanna raise a question um, that was brought in the chat a little bit earlier by Sister Shafia. Um, and I'll pass it to you, McGravi, um, or anyone who feels comfortable to answer. But the question is, could you please speak on the connection of the training by Israel of the US police forces, the police training facilities across the US and including Cop City in Atlanta, if there's some connection there. I, I I did at some point look into that, and uh, there was extensive uh, training for uh, police uh, departments in the U.S. By uh, uh, they would send them to Israel for training, and sometimes they would do it here, but with Israeli trainers. And uh, you know that the the Israeli approach to policing is like. Uh, 
is almost like warfare. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, policing as we would understand policing. It's almost like warfare. You know, you and and you see evidence of that. You see examples of that in the way they you know they deal with uh, uh, with with uh, especially black uh, uh, victims that they uh, they kill and torture and and, and so on. And uh, so it's uh, it's something that uh, it's it's really a very important issue, and I think somehow somehow um, the various police departments have to find a way to train their people in, uh, in, 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 in a policing way that uh, that uh, is not that's short of warfare. Uh, to put it crudely, and I don't know, I don't know what what more to say about this, but uh, it's a, it's a really serious problem. Thank you so much, and just as someone who works uh, organizes on the front line of police and prison abolition, I just uh, definitely uh, appreciate that connection to to inform folks on Sahara. Yes, and, and I'm, I'm just wanting to emphasize uh, what uh, Fuad has said, because it's not, you know, in addition, I mean, and boy, did I see the um, police, the IDF, the uh, at work. And as he said, I mean, the, the violence uh, that they use uh, against the Palestinians and against anybody who's opposing uh, what they were doing uh, and to, you know, this is the last thing we need in the United States is for our police to be trained to be even more violent than they already are because they already are violent and uh, particularly to black and brown people as we well know. Uh, and let's not forget the surveillance uh, technologies that uh, Israel uh, ships around the world, including to the United States for the police uh, forces to use because they have perfected the surveillance. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And so this is going to be used here in our country against those of us, particularly uh, who are progressives and are involved in social change. And we see now in Cop City, you're gonna bring RICO charges against people who are organizing. They're gonna do big time with RICO charges. So, you know, the fascism is being exported from Israel to the United States and we're paying for it. I mean, our tax dollars, this is so outrageous. So thank you. Ayana, may I say one thing? Uh, of course. What has been happening, in my opinion, is the Israelization of American policing yes. and the Israelization of America in general. Uh, not just policing, but you know the way they deal with foreign policy issues. The, the way you know, it's 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 the process of Israelization, yes. and it's not a very very. It's not uh, congruent with having a democratic society. Not at all. Definitely not. Thank you so much. I want to see if Renee, sorry to put you on the spot, but I wanted to catch a question that you had earlier and curious if you're able to come off of mute. Um, you had a general question about how do we talk to folks like this, you know, specifically around organizing long term with um you know folks who are church based so just want to make space for you to amplify that question um that's an interesting question but not so much the thrust of my question i was i was very interested in in what the panelists thoughts might be about sort of the long term concerted direct effort on the part of christian right churches mm -hmm. and i'm more familiar with evangelical churches with my mom to tell you the truth well, it's been interesting to me for a number of years, there's been this very direct, concerted, intentional relationship to supporting Israel, you know, and it, it started talking about the Jewish people, you know, and that was a really easy link to make. 
but it it's been gloves off Israel, you know, for quite some time. And I wonder, just thoughts, if you would. I just find it troubling. When I was in the West Bank uh, in nine, between ninety nine and two thousand three, I I was amazed to see how many thousands of these people come on tours mm -hmm. organized by different churches and they come and I know this because my wife one of my wife's relatives uh, came on one of those tours and she called us and we went to see her and she told us what they do it's absolutely amazing the brainwashing and the propaganda they subject them to is they have worked very diligently for years to cultivate support among the American right evangelical Christians. Um, how do you break that? Ah, well, I don't know, but I mean, that's something to think about. Um, they don't even know that we have Christians, you know, in, among the Palestinians. It's as if Jesus Christ was born in Ohio or something, you know. And uh, but it's uh, it's it's a very scary thing, in my opinion, very scary thing. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Like Barbara, say something. <laughs> yeah, just using my actual hand. Uh, I think it's really important for us, uh, and that's why this is such a wonderful. Uh, time for us this evening. I think it's really important for us to know and to understand what's going on because there are black churches and black Christians who are not necessarily fundamentalists or evangelicals who take pride in having vis visited the Holy Land. Yes. And of course, visiting the Holy Land means that you're going against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, but they're not very aware of that. Now, um, I can't tell you the details but within a Black for Palestine, there are people who are doing specifically organizing around faith organizations and getting faith organizations to, uh, well, not just sign on to our statement, but to be involved in speaking out about what's going on uh, with Israel and in Gaza against Palestinians. So um, just as you, know, you, you brought up like the, what the right wing is doing, there are progressive people who are doing making an effort to identify those uh, faith organizations and institutions that would take the, a much more humane stand and also stand much more in line with the doctrine they say they indeed believe in. Thank you so much for naming that. Thank you. I believe we have one more time uh, time for one more question. If folks could stick around with us for just about five minutes over, we do apologize, but we want to make sure that y'all have enough information and feel comfortable to then, after this call, go back to your communities and organize and mobilize um, in light of Palestinian resistance. So I just wanted to see if we have just one more question that folks want to ask, if you don't mind raising your hand or coming off of mute. And then if we had any in the chat, let's keep bump that up. Let's see. I see one from Karma. See, wondering if panelists would speak on connections of the US, Israel, and South Africa history of apartheid, militarization of police, and current connections to the Congo, Sudan, Mali, Africom, and the push to export anti-feminist, anti-LGBTQ legislation as a seeding of fascism. And I'm going to kick it off to you, Barbara, to start us off with this one, and then I welcome any of our other panelists. Uh, so clearly, this person who wrote the question wants us to be here all night. <laughs> he calls the questions. You know, like, there's so much in that question, and I don't think there's any way uh, that I, I certainly can't handle all of it. I am not a big expert on international affairs, although this has been my year to uh, change that. I've always been an internationalist. I've always been at the demonstrations, at the protests, through the broad outlines. But as far as like reading international news every single day, that wasn't me. 
always meaning something that was of value, but it wasn't that, you know. Uh, you know, all those not all those wonderful novels by black women writers, you know. But be that as it may, um I I I did think earlier in our conversation about when we were talking about the training and who gets what from whom. Um the Nazis got how to treat Jewish people during the Holocaust. They studied Jim Crow in the United States for that. So Nazis were studying how uh, white America treated black Americans as they built the Nazi, you know, the Nazi nightmare. And then South Africa, like South Africa, paralleling what was going on in the United States. I don't know if the uh, the Afrikaners, if they got it from the United States, but we know that the United States government did not take strong stands against apartheid uh, particularly during the Reagan administration when things were coming to a boiling point. Um, and, you know, like, the, well, wrong is just wrong. You know, I feel like I'm going to go back to something my grandmother would say, who is, by the way, from Dublin, Georgia, just for all y'all on the call who think that I'm a big Yankee here. But, and I am, I am. But the thing is, uh, people in my family, like most people in my generation, uh, we have our roots, you know, our Southern uh, roots. But the thing is wrong is just wrong. And the thing is the United States, when it's wrong because of settler colonialism, because of white supremacy, people borrow, you know. Polaroid was big. Polaroid camera cameras were, was big in South Africa because they were uh, had the technology with those uh, fast, you know, fast developing film, which of course people don't even have to deal with now. But like in those days, a Polaroid that you could get an image out of within a minute, that was very useful when you're trying to make sure that everybody is where they belong and everybody is staying in their place. So yeah, there's all kinds of uh, bad cross-pollination. As far as um, the uh, exporting the LGBTQ legislation, particularly to African nations, now I am aware of that. That is incredibly dangerous because the right wing de denominations in our country are exporting exporting homophobia. And what that results in is dead black people in African nations, people being jailed and or killed because of their so-called Christian, uh, you know, the Christian beliefs. Uh, there's an organization that if you want to find out more about some of these things, it's called Political Research Associates. And Political Research Associates has been following the right wing. We haven't talked that much about fascism and authoritarianism this evening, except by, by implication. But the thing is, Political Research Associates has a lot of research on how religious organizations and others are helping to uh, build a global, uh, a global uh, quagmire of uh, anti-democracy and and, and uh, fascist and authoritarian regimes. So that's a place to look at. And as I said, I, I don't know all the whys and wherefores, but at least that's a little bit. Thank may you. I, so may I say something, a few words about this? Um, I've been to South Africa several times, and I met with many of the anti-apartheid activists, and m m they all support Palestinians, and uh, and uh, many of them have come to visit the West Bank and and, and and Gaza Strip, and they tell us that what they see the, in in Palestine, Israel, is so much worse than what they went through. Uh, in the apartheid system, mm -hmm. and um, but the, you know there's a there's a tremendous amount of uh, research and uh, back and forth uh, help that goes back and forth between us and these people in South Africa, and and uh, the relations that were so close during the apartheid period between the Israelis and the South African uh, are gone. I mean they're finished, and now. South Africa was one of the first countries to sever diplomatic relations with Israel. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the solidarity among people uh, to try to fight against this injustice. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it to you, Zahara, to close us out with tonight's uh, question and answer. 
Okay, well, uh, uh, Fuad has just mentioned one of the things I was going to mention, and that is that South Africa is one of uh, a number of countries that have severed diplomatic relations with Israel. Uh, as of a few minutes before I got on, I have Bolivia, which has severed all diplomatic uh, relationships, uh, Jordan, Bahrain, Turkey, Chad, and of course, South Africa. Um, and the question was raised about the you know struggle in Sudan, which is of course an internal struggle. I've been working very hard to find out whose side the U.S. is on and why on earth uh, you know, the African Union or some of the other uh, uh, African internet uh, bodies are not doing more to try to bring that horrible uh, uh, civil war uh, with huge numbers of uh, displaced people, uh, hundreds killed, uh, possibly thousands, um, but lastly, I just wanted to say that those of us who are organizing here in the United States, we must uh, look at what's happening in the world because things are changing and people in the global South are throwing off Western dom dom uh, domination uh, and we must be... Uh, educating ourselves as to what is going on. Uh, hopefully you're uh, looking at the BRICS uh, plus now, you know, the uh, Brazil and uh, Russia and China and India. Uh, and now they've added, and South Africa, of course, the original uh, BRICS and then these that they've added. And these people are trying to get out from under uh, U.S. domination uh, uh, economically and militarily. And in my view, uh, these are people that we uh, want to be allied with uh, because they are sick and tired of colonialism, neo-colonialism, uh, and we need to, in my view, make sure we're educated about what's going on we can't just look at the domestic issues because they're tied in. And lastly, the U.S. is, uh, what is it, $800 billion uh, defense budget uh, is money that we need here at home. You know, we can't get universal health care. We don't have college tuition paid for. We don't have help with housing and stuff, but yet we're really spending more like a trillion a year on militarism. And so we have to really look at this. Dr. King uh, pointed that out in his amazing speech he made in 1967, where he talked about the triple evils of militarism, uh, materialism and racism. And people are in many of the uh, workshops that are being held about what's happening in Palestine. They are quoting from Dr. King's speech, just as we in the National Council of Elders have a project called the King and Breaking Silence. And so we who are political progressives, we must break silence around international issues and how they are related to our domestic situation in this country. Thank you so much, Sahara, for closing us out. And I am so sorry that we do not have enough time to continue to dig deeper into this, but we do hope that this is the first of many teach-ins so that we as organizers and participants in our community's defense are able to really be knowledgeable and to be able to mobilize and fully show up in solidarity with oppressed peoples. So excellent. Thank you all again. I just want to give a warm welcome um, and appreciation to our panelists, Barbara Smith, 
Dr. Farald McGravi and Zahara Simmons. If folks can just give some love by showing an emoji or dropping it in the chat, just want to just thank, say thank you so much again, just for giving us so much information and really answering our questions. Thank you. And to all of y'all who joined in this evening, we really appreciate you and have a great night. على عهد على ديني على أرض تلاقيني أنا نهلي أنا فديهم أنا دم فلسطيني 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 أنا دم فلسطيني